so she was born Veronica Cohen in Kingston, New York in 1946. She grew up having Hollywood dreams and decided to take the new last name of Chasen after Chasen's restaurant in West Hollywood, which okay. is one of those places all the celebrities would hang out in. She came to LA in the 70s and got some small parts on Guiding Light and the Patty Duke show. But her brother was the director of the movie The Stuff. Oh, really? The horror movie, The Stuff in the, the 80s? horror movie. Wow, really? If you could call that horror, which has my favorite line of uh, the military guy is like, I've had enough of your liberal remarks. <laughs> so this guy, not the not the liberal remarks guy, yeah. the director of this movie needed a publicist. So he decided to try his sister. Why not? Yeah. Ask his sister. sister she's going to her sister. Daryl, why, why not? <laughs> um, so she decided to try her hand at being a publicist. And as tempting as a life of small roles on the Patty Duke show might have been, <laughs> she decided to stick with publicist. Right. -ing. She became the head of publicity <laughs> at MGM. She had his clients, Michael Douglas, Diane Warren, Hans Zimmer. And eventually she opened her own PR firm called Chasen & Co. They specialized in Oscar campaigns for movie studios and she got her clients over 150 Oscar nominations. Whoa. And she was behind seven best picture winning campaigns, including Driving Miss Daisy and all three winners from 2008 to 2010, which were No Country for Old Men, Slumdog cool. Millionaire cool. and The Hurt Locker. Cool. I almost called it the William Hurt Locker. <laughs> Because I saw Millionaire and I thought William Hurt Locker. No, no, it's a John Hurt, the John Hurt Locker. <laughs> she knew everybody in Hollywood and everybody loved her. She also once dated John Williams. Oh, wow. You can date John Williams and not be Daisy Ridley? <laughs> <laughs> you can't be a, a much too young girl from a movie he did late in life? That he fawned over in front of everybody? It was like, so oh weird. If, you, if, you, if I haven't told this story before, I went to the Hollywood Bowl with John Williams. No, to see John Williams. Uh, no. I was sitting with, with John Williams. We went to see The Simpsons. He personally invited me. I could feel it. But he, he started, it was before, or it was either right before or right after The Force Awakens. And he was going off about like, there's this woman in the movie. Oh, she's so charming. She's so beautiful and wonderful. Her name is Daisy Ridley. And I wrote this song just for her. So this like 90 year old man is talking about this 18 year old girl or whatever. But anyway. Yes. She, Thank you. So she knew everybody. Slumdog Williams and Air. John Hurt Locker, whatever. But then on the night of November 16th, 2010, my anniversary, just after midnight, November 16th, 2010, she was driving home from an after party for the premiere of the movie Burlesque at the W Hotel in Hollywood to her condo in the Regency Wilshire. She was driving down Sunset, heading west, and at 12.28 a.m., wouldn't you know it, but she found herself stopped at the red light at Sunset oh and Whittier. At that moment, somebody came up to her passenger window, fired four bullets through oh the window. God. She managed to hit the gas and turn left and the car glided a quarter of a mile before hitting a pole oh no. at the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. The song playing on the radio when the paramedics arrived was White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. Oh, that's not, that's the trailer. Yeah, I know. This is the, trailer, the trailer for the for Ronnie the Chasen, Chasen movie. Story, yeah. She was rushed to Cedar sinai but she died at 1.12 a.m. Oh, so thing. what happened here? Yeah. As with every other story that takes place at the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle, we don't really know what happened. Right. Except, I guess, the Howard Hughes thing. He was and uh, hu yeah. hubris. So. <laughs> and the Janet Dean thing. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know where that gardener's truck came from. Uh, he was only going 60. <laughs> Immediately following the shooting, there were rumors of shady movie financing or road rage or just a random drive-by. Uh, they weren't even completely sure if there had been a second person in the car with Chasen. Like, okay. They just didn't know what happened. Some people thought it was an art deal gone wrong with the Russian mob. Some people thought her brother got her involved in his gambling debts. Some people looked at the fact that her brother's daughter, when they looked at her will, she was left $10 with the note that she did so intentionally and with full knowledge of the consequences. Jeez. And meanwhile, that lady's sister got all $6 million of Ronnie Whoa. Chasen's estate. So something weird was happening there. Yeah. But the man who the police looked to was a man named Harold Smith. Smith was a man down on his luck. He'd been in and out of prison for years. He'd been hoping to get a $15,000 settlement from a hit and run that he'd been in, but he ended up only getting $5,000, so he was in desperate need of money. And an hour and a half after Chasen had been killed, Smith went over to his neighbors in the Harvey Apartments at 5640 Santa Monica Boulevard next to Hollywood Forever, which is just kind of a not a place you want to be. Yeah, yeah. This neighbor's name was Laramie Becke, and he asked him, Smith asked him if the police had been around. This was an hour and a half after the event. He asked him if police had been around or if there was anything on TV. Laramie had no idea what he's talking about, right. so Smith said, 
forget this conversation oh ever happened. God. But then the next morning, he, forget how suspicious I'm being right now. Don't, <laughs> don't even mind. think about it. This is just me. But then the next morning, Smith came over to borrow money so he could take a bus to Beverly Hills so he could get his bike. Laramie still had no idea what this was yeah. about. But over the next couple of days, Smith's behavior became more paranoid. And he was saying things like, I messed up. And he oh, was bragging geez. about killing someone and having a gun and that how he'd rather die before going back to prison. But apparently he often lied about things. He told tall tales yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. He just talked and people didn't think much of it. But then four days after the incident, on November 20th, the story of Chasen's murder was on America's Most Wanted, which Laramie was watching and immediately called the Beverly Hills Police oh Department. He put it all together. The police looked into Smith's record and they and the two things that were red flags for the police were that in 1998, he, Smith had robbed a woman on Doheny in Beverly Hills. And also on the evening of the murder, the police department had gotten reports of a suspicious African-American man lurking in the vicinity, but you could have picked any evening of the year and you could find those calls at the <laughs> Beverly Hills Police Department. But Smith was black, so... Beverly Hills PD. Beverly Hills PD. It fit their description. They thought, this is probably our guy that's the best lead we yeah. have. So on December 1st, they went to the Harvey... By the way, I don't agree with them. Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But this sounds, is, this is what they like, were thinking. Yeah. So on December 1st, they went to the Harvey Apartments to question Smith and what luck... They ran into him in the lobby, and upon seeing them, he pulls a gun out of his jacket and shoots himself in the head. You are kidding. Smith is dead. Dude, let him ask one question. He already said, I'm not going to prison again. Oh, my God. Inside his bags, they found four empty shell casings, which proved to be a 60% match to the ones that were used to kill Chasen, and that was enough for the Beverly Hills Police Department to call it a day and say a few months later the case was solved and everybody involved is dead. But, but why... <laughs> well, the people who were paying attention noticed a lot of glaring details here. The most glaring being that there was no evidence that Smith was in Beverly Hills right. when this happened. Also, they never dusted the passenger side of the car for fingerprints. The cops barely interviewed the neighbors or used their security footage, which I'm sure there was a ton of yeah. in Beverly Hills. Also, they never got a higher match than just 60% on the bullets used yeah, to kill well. Jason and the bullet that Smith had used to kill himself. That's not enough. Like that is yeah. not enough to say that this guy did it. Plus there were problems with Laramie's testimonial and why would Smith ride his bike to Beverly Hills to murder somebody and then leave his bike there? Yeah. How did he get home and why would he do that? Yeah. Plus her purse was left in the car which would be an important thing to take if you're murdering somebody to rob them. Yeah. Like none of it really made sense and the full details of the case were not released at the time and the Beverly Hills Police Department would not answer requests to view the full files until six years later 200 pages of documents relating to this case were released and it became very clear that the BHPD completely bought bungled the investigation oh and that we do not know for sure that Smith killed Jason. We don't know who did this. Yeah. Some people believe that Smith did it, but was hired to do it because he needed money. But who hired him if that's the case? In any case, we don't know what exactly happened. And there was some shady police business going on in the investigation. And a few years later, the police chief in charge of it was fired for taking part in backdoor financial deals. Oh. A complete disaster. 